Well, let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks for drawing us together virtually and in person on this Lord's Day. We pray that you grant us grace and insight to see and to perceive your work and your word in our world and to reflect that in our lives. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Well, I'd like to uh, begin with um, a little biographical stuff on Doris Betts. I know, I know some of you have read her work um, and are acquainted with her, but I always think it's informative to, in understanding where the person, where the author's coming from and understanding her story. So I've got a little, um, little PowerPoint on her. And um, if, you, if your screen is like mine, I've got the thumbnails on the right-hand side. You can minimize that up at the top if you want to see more of the slide. So Doris Betts, um, North Carolina writer and teacher of writers. I was at uh, Chapel Hill in the mid-70s, and she was a legend uh, even then. Uh, and when I say teacher of writers, uh, adding that, she was not only a great writer herself, but she was a tremendous teacher. And she taught introductory level creative writing, among other things. She would get the freshmen and sophomores. And she loved working with these young uh, writers and helping guide them. She won uh, several awards for her teaching. Um, I was not into creative writing. I didn't ever had her in a class. Um, the closest I got to her was uh, she attended a couple of faculty cocktail parties at our fraternity house, uh, but she was a legend on campus. Doris Wall Betts was born in 1932. She was the only child of mill workers in Statesville, North Carolina. That's a town up at the very foot of the Blue Ridge. Um, her, she said her parents were not educated, but they both worked very hard to make sure she was educated. Uh, they attended a small conservative Presbyterian church in Statesville, and that would prove to be very formative for her in her later spirituality and writing. She attended the, what was then called the Woman's College of the University of North Carolina in Greensboro, where she, among other things, was feature editor of the newspaper she won the Mademoiselle Magazine College Fiction Contest as a sophomore. That was, that's the best college fiction written in the country, uh, the award given by Mademoiselle Magazine at the time. She was elected to Phi Beta Kappa and uh, met a young law student uh, while she was in college named Lowry Betts. Uh, she, they married, uh, she had, they had a child and she never completed her degree. She worked a, as a newspaper reporter in several cities around North Carolina as um, uh, Lowry's work took them different places. Uh, she, during that time, she publishes two collections of short stories and two novels. And uh, because of the notoriety of her writing, she's appointed to the UNC Creative Writing faculty in 1966. While on faculty, she publishes another collection of short stories and four more novels. And uh, she won for one of those novels, Souls Raised from the Dead, the Southern Book Award in 94. Our story, The Ugliest Pilgrim, is part of her second collection of short stories published in 73, uh, entitled Beast of the Southern Wilds, which uh, was nominated for a National Book Award. While she's on faculty at Chapel Hill, um, her husband, Lowry Betts, becomes a, a district judge for um, Chatham County, which is just south of Chapel Hill. And they uh, have a horse farm outside of the town of Pittsburgh. And she walks into the Pittsburgh Presbyterian Church one Sunday, not knowing a soul. She said there were about 50 or 60 people in attendance. And uh, even though geographically close to Chapel Hill, that culturally it was a world apart mm -hmm. and none of the people there knew who she was and which she found very refreshing because they, they met her and treated her as just another individual and she was able to form very authentic and close relationships in that congregation. She taught Sunday school there. While in Pittsburgh, she's 
very involved in the community on the board of the Friends of the Library. She organizes the local literary league. Uh, another North Carolina writer, Alan Gergana, says of her, she was a fully operational Presbyterian. <laughs> Among her many um, awards, she was uh, named a Guggenheim Fellow in 58. Uh, she wins the North Carolina Medal of Literature in 75, Parker Award in 82, the John Dos Passos Award, American Academy of Arts and Letters Medal of Merit in 89. And the story we're taking up this morning is made into a short film and it's entitled Violet and also later becomes a, a Broadway musical, off-Broadway musical, um, and uh, the short film won an Academy Award. I looked all over, I looked in every platform I could think of to see if there was a recording of Violet available to watch and I couldn't find it anywhere, which I was disappointed in because I'd love to see how it was adapted. She retired from uh, UNC 1998. At the time her title was Alumni Distinguished Professor of English. She'd also been the first woman president of the faculty senate. Uh, all of this from a person who never got her bachelor's degree. Uh, usually uh, the way these endowed professorships work that someone will, will give the money to the university to establish the professorship. Well, it, the university gave the money in honor of her to set up a professorship in her name. So just some quotes, uh, which I think are insightful to uh, understand her point of view in writing. Producing stories and poems may not be a good way to make a living, but it's a wonderful way to make a life. She was asked one time, what, uh, what made you want to become a writer? Oh, Bible stories without question. It makes you feel that the ordinary is not ordinary. She said, on religious matters, I prefer to whisper. The reliable attention-getting method of mothers of young children. Now contrast that, and oftentimes comparisons are made between uh, Betts and Flannery O'Connor, who some of you may have done the session I did on, on, a, on Flannery. Uh, Flannery's famous quote is, uh, to the, to the uh, heart of hearing you shout, and to the almost blind, you draw large and startling figures. <laughs> a very different approach. Uh, also on matters of how grace is communicated. Um, you know, O'Connor communicates grace by shock, oftentimes by violent shock. Whereas uh, Betts communicates grace in a much more gentler, more hopeful way, as we'll see in this story. As to the presence of God in her stories, she said, if you see it, you will see it. If you don't see it, no one can persuade you. But she also said, if you see a little mouse running across my pages, that mouse is a Christian mouse. <laughs> the overarching interest in her stories for her is how people handle life's great questions. She said, if you really want to ask the questions of, that Job asked, why shouldn't you ask them of a highway patrolman, a beautician, or a shoe salesman at Belks? And we'll see in our story this morning that um, she treats uh, the characters she, that she takes up are just very ordinary people. They're no big grand personalities, although Violet has a big personality in our story. Uh, she's not a, a big person in society's eyes. Uh, um, I know some of you were able to read the story. Would it be helpful for, do you have a, a copy in front of you or would it be more helpful for me to put a copy on the screen as we discuss it? I, I say put it on the screen because I don't know how to pull it up while I'm listening to you. Okay, I uh, will do that. Okay, The Ugliest Pilgrim, uh, just a general overview of the story. Um, we have a, a young woman from Spruce Pine, North Carolina. That's not far from where Owen is, up in the uh, northern 
Blue Ridge Mountains of uh, North Carolina. Um, and she is setting out on what she calls a pilgrimage. She said herself that she has an ugly scar on her face. That's all we know of it. And uh, this story has a very interesting perspective because it, it is written from uh, in, in the first person. So the only knowledge we have in the story is what the main character tells us and what she tells us other people have said. Uh, it's a her, this is all totally from her perspective. We don't get anybody else's perspective. We don't get the third party narrator where it's looking at everything, the omniscient narrator. It's all from this perspective of this girl, Violet Carl. And uh, she's taking a bus to Tulsa, Oklahoma to meet a preacher that she's seen on television, a healer. She encounters uh, several people on the bus and she makes friends with two of them, uh, two soldiers. This is uh, set in 1969 at the peak of the Vietnam War. So a lot of young men are drafted. Uh, one of the soldiers is black and the other one is white. Uh, they meet at another stop. Uh, they're going to a same camp and they become friends. All three of them become, become friends. And um, on the trip, they great, grow quite close. And uh, Violet ends up having a sexual encounter with uh, one of them, almost has it with the black one, but then has it with the white one. And um, they kind of fall in love. She goes to Oklahoma. Tulsa, very shocking kind of um, urban environment. Not she's not used to anything like that. She seeks out the uh, the preacher's church, which she describes as uh, looking more like a a uh, factory. I think it, it, it what didn't he say it was more like a no, an, an insurance office, an insurance office. An interesting for a healer comparison to insurance. Um, she can't get to see it, get, can't get in to see the preacher. So she meets with his assistant who ends up being younger than she is. And she sizes him up very quickly. Violet um, is a very perceptive young woman and um, doesn't get any satisfaction from, from the preacher or from the assistant. She gets on the bus, goes back. Um, the uh, Monty or the man she has the encounter with says he'll be waiting for her at the bus station. And she thinks to herself, well, if he recognizes me, my scar hasn't been healed and I'm going to run away from him because I know it's a defense mechanism. I know he's going to all end up rejecting me. Uh, he, he does see her. He waits for her at the bus station and uh, she does run away, but uh, he ends up catching her at the end. And uh, we'll, we'll read that ending towards the, uh, at, towards the end of the class. So um, let me ask before we get into uh, any particular passages, um, anyone, what did you think of Violet? Those of you who've read the story, what are your impressions of Violet Carl? I loved her. <laughs> I, after reading the story, I loved her. I absolutely loved her in her simple life and in her... Um, grief, I would say, over her ruined looks. She saw beauty all around her. Mm -hmm. She even saw grace in a rattlesnake. Yeah. So here, yeah. Here is a young woman who is sensitive and perceptive and appreciative. And I think that she's full of love that is guarded because of her scarred face. Yep, great insights. Um, I want to try and find one of those quotes um, at the very beginning of the story, she um, is describing, she keeps a notebook and she's describing her notebook and the things that are in it. And uh, at the, in the pages in the back, uh, there is, let's go to that page. Right here, he says, uh, pages in the back, uh, one repeated entry, hi, printed off Mama's torn catechism. Glorify God and enjoy him forever. It's the answer to the first question of the old Westminster catechism. What is the chief end of man to glorify God 
and enjoy him forever. And she takes that as her mantra. That's her guiding principle. She becomes, uh, it infuses her whole perspective on the world. And the, uh, the word praise is in her mind or on her lips 14 times in the story. She is talking about praising God or praising aspects of God's creation. So um, what do you think Violet is really seeking on a deep level? Ostensibly, what she says is she's going on a pilgrimage for a healing of her scar. But what is she really seeking? Maybe affirmation, for one thing acknowledgement of uh, who she really is, regardless of the, the way she feels about her looks. Yeah. Acceptance. Acceptance, yeah. Yep, she seems like a lonely person, doesn't she? She, yeah. just, she doesn't have many friends on the mountain. Well, coming from Spruce Pine, there's not many people there. That's right, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I doubt there's that many young people. Yeah, and uh, you call at the beginning of the story, the, the man who speaks to her in the bus station in Spruce Pine, uh, she just blows him off. And I think she sees, she sees through the shallowness of a lot of the people in her life, and she doesn't, um, doesn't uh, have time for that. It's interesting That's also to, to consider who, who is named in the story and who goes unnamed. So we have Violet Carl and we have the two soldiers. We know their first and last names. Uh, the only other person whose name we know is uh, the first bus driver. Mr. Weatherman. He gets on the bus, he takes the time to read his name plate uh, and writes it down in her notebook because in her naivete, she thinks, well, this is gonna be the man to take me on my pilgrimage all the way there and all the way back. But of course he gets off the bus somewhere in Tennessee has changed drivers, and uh, no other driver is mentioned by name. The preacher, as prominent as he is in her imagination, is never mentioned by name. It's some kind of an abstraction for her. Uh, the preacher's assistant is not mentioned by name. The old lady in the bus is not mentioned by name. Mm -hmm. Even her cousin, she's thinking of staying with her cousins in Memphis. She never names her cousins. That's a good point. How um, how did you all feel about the sex scene in the story? Well, I felt like she was an innocent young person. <clears throat> yet she understood what was getting ready to happen to her. Yeah. You say she did or did not understand it? She understood what was getting ready to happen to her. Yeah, because she narrates an earlier sexual experience from high school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, apparently there have been, there've been others. <clears throat> but um, it told so, so right in character. Um, I, I'm just in awe of Doris Betts' writing ability and characterization. It's mm -hmm. She really enters in, I mean, she really, becomes the character, doesn't she? I mean, she's entered so much in the whole imagination and perspective. But the question of perspective is interesting also because the only thing we know <clears throat> about the scar is what Violet thinks of the scar. Right. Uh, we never have any comment. No one else in the story says anything about it at all. Um, and uh, so we're left to wonder, is it as bad as Violet thinks it is? Um, there are a couple of uh, telling uh, things in the, in the story. Um, when early on, when they're starting on the bus trip <clears throat> and uh, she's talking with this old woman on the bus and she says the old woman stares past her and is looking at the rock face on the opposite side of the road as the bus drives down. So her face is not so remarkable that the woman's staring at her. 
Um, and when she first meets the black soldier, Flick, um, he said he looked at her and there was no visible expression on his face. He's not registering anything like, oh my gosh. Which lets you know it's her that thinks everybody's looking at the scar and not the other, and not the people. Say that one more time. I right. she thinks everybody sees her scar, but yet they don't even look for it or look at it. And yeah. I had a school teacher who had a, a really bad face scar where her face was sunken in. And I never thought about it till I read this. And then many yeah. years ago. They, everyone in the story from the narration or from the dialogue, they accept her as a as a person, as a just a kind of they call it, they recognize her sense of humor, they recognize how perceptive she is about things. Uh, they they see her for who she for is herself. So what do you make? What do you make of the of the um, ordering in the story where we we know there's a scar on her face? She describes it as going from her from her um, lip up uh, over to the to her ear. That's it's long. What, what do you make of the way that um, Betts doesn't reveal how she got the scar until towards the end of the story? What, what, why do you think she does that? And how do you think that works to influence the reader? I think that that, that reveals the trauma that she, in, that she experienced when the head of the acts hit her face and, and created the scar that she was in a, a shower of blood. Uh -huh. So it was very traumatic. And so <clears throat> perhaps part of her, her dismay at her scar is an echo of that trauma uh -huh. throughout her lifetime. And I wanted to ask you, John, about something else. Didn't the two soldiers, wasn't there a little exchange? Maybe it was in her imagination. They were talking about don't look at a woman's face. That's not what is important. Yeah. <laughs> but you yeah. get right down to it. Right. Yeah. And yeah, there's something said very explicit about that. I'm not going to repeat on the air. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's not important to them. Um, and they, they take her fully for who she is. Um, but I, I think when we see a person who's disabled, our natural response is to look away and not see it because mm -hmm. we're not trying to bring it's like in us mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah I think, you, I think you have to look at history because back in the 40s and 50s and probably earlier people did look at, at what was wrong with a person and mm -hmm. somehow or another we evolved into not letting that happen as much. Mm hmm Yeah. Regarding your first question, though, in this series right now, um, John, you asked about the uh, how late in the story we learned about how the injury happened or how the scar mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. And I, for me, it built up the anticipation about what, what happened to this girl? Uh -huh. What is it that she carries with her? And I, I guess I thought all along, is this scar really as bad as she thinks it is? Or is there um, an internal damage that happened that yeah. is the real pain? Um, yeah, yeah, I he, think. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really getting at it. Um, no one in the story asked her anything about it. Mm -hmm. uh, it, they never even make a comment about it. The only only reference is uh, that when the old lady is with her in the in the bus station bathroom and she says something about you know looks looks aren't everything. But she doesn't reference the scar necessarily. So um, yeah, I think it's something deeper. The wound is deeper, mm -hmm. and the the desire that she has is deeper than going on pilgrimage to the preacher. It's not that she wants, wants the scar healed. What does she really want? I think she really wants intimacy. Mm -hmm. She really wants intimacy with another human being. And uh, so the narration on the, 
her narration on the bus when Monty falls asleep in the seat beside her and he's laying his head on her yeah. shoulder and his hand rests in her lap and he's and she just savors that the, the feel yeah. the smell the touch all of it is so wonderful for her and um when oh. uh, when Monty comes in her hotel room and they're in Memphis I think um she's welcomes him literally welcomes him with open arms into her bed mm -hmm. um and uh so yeah it's mm -hmm. it's a fulfillment of of relationship i think um wondering uh she has a deep soul she is a character that um Betts has created with a very deep soul and yeah. it longs for it is it is soul intimacy i think that she longs for most of all mm -hmm. the, the physical intimacy that comes that seems to satisfy her is just um accentuated by the when when um Monty chases after her and catches yeah. her and there there is the coming together of two souls yeah that, um is so rewarding yeah well, let me just um, lift out a couple of passages in the story, which I think are beautiful. Um, find these on here. Um, over here. Uh, so, um, Violet has learned to play poker with her father during the long winters on on the mountain. And uh, man, she knows that she knows that game backwards and forwards, mm -hmm. and uh, that's how she kind of gets in with the two paratroopers. Is uh, she's noticing how this black guy deals the cards? She says, "One-handed grip, mechanics grip. It's the middle finger. He can second deal and bottom deal. He can buckle the top card with his thumb and peep." I'll be damned," said the paratrooper. <laughs> and the black guy goes, "Lady, you want to play?" I slide my dishes back. I get mad if I'm cheated. <laughs> so she's naive about some things, but she's worldly wise about others. And then um, they ask her where she's going. She says, it's a pilgrimage. And she um, goes, talks about going to the preacher from India. And uh, then she, um, down here, she describes, um, or she thinks to herself, I think for a minute, I'm going to have to take out my notebook and unglue the envelope. She talks earlier about an envelope that's in there. We don't know what's in the envelope. Read them all the scripture I've looked up on my way on why I should be healed. So she is backing up her case. She has combed through the Bible and she's pulled all of these cases out of healings, all kinds of different healings, Old Testament and New Testament. And she's got many of them committed to memory. Um, when she gets to the preacher's assistant, she hands him the, the, um, all the scripture citations that she's written out and her justification for why she should be healed. Um, what are, how would you, and then this, the, the assistant counters her with yeah. a couple of quotes from the Bible he throws out. How would you characterize the way Violet uses scripture and the way the preacher's assistant uses scripture. She spars beautifully with him. He uses it as platitudes. She uses it as the living word of God. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. For her, it is absolutely the living word of God. Mm. The assistant uses it to, to create distance, to push her away. Oh, yeah. He, she's using it to put her in relationship to God. She's like arguing her case before God. She's shaking her fist at God. So if you can do this for all these people, you can do it for me. So the assistant is also, I think the assistant is also using uh, scripture as platitudes also to justify why they can't do what she wants. <laughs> <It's not> possible. <laughs> Yeah, he's using it as, as cover, isn't he? Mm -hmm. um, I found this quote that she mentioned earlier about the, and I want to read read that about the um, 
let's see. Oh, okay. Um, she's um, <clears throat> she's responding to something Monty says. Monty says um, he's kind of warning her. He's kind of bracing her about the preacher and how how he's probably not legitimate. And he says things are mean and ugly in this world. I mean, act ugly, do ugly, be ugly. Is that to which she responds up here at the top? He's wrong. When I leave my house, I can walk for miles and everything's beautiful. Even the rattlesnakes have grace. Oh. Isn't that something? And everywhere she goes, here at the bottom of the page, she's praising God. And uh, they get to the first place they get to in Tennessee, Johnson, praise God for Johnson City, because that's on her way to pilgrimage. And then here at the bottom, she says, praise God for Knoxville and two new friends. Mm -hmm. And um, here at the bottom of 96, another instance of, of her spirituality. I would not want God's power to turn me, after all, into a man. His breath is so warm. Talking about Monty. Everywhere, my skin is singing. Praise God for that. When I get my first look at the Mississippi River, the pencil goes straight into my pocketbook. How much praise would that take? Mm. And then on the next page, uh, right up here, she says, um, it's funny how much right now I feel like praising all good things I've ever seen in places I haven't been. You know, I wonder, her, her biblical knowledge and understanding is so deep. I wonder if Betts is, is also creating a character here who has everything she needs to be well, to be healed. Um, and, and when she gets to the point where, which is the destination for her pilgrimage, pilgrimage being a search for an encounter with the divine when she gets there it's clear that she's had a much deeper encounter with the divine than the preacher she's been on her way to see yeah yeah she's a very full fully developed spiritual being yeah i think so yeah um i mean i just love these uh these quotes of praise i circled every one of them on uh 101. Now there are two things too big for my notebook. Yeah. <laughs> Praise God and for the Mississippi too. This is after her, the um, Trist. their sexual encounter. And uh, this is so, so perceptive. This shows her how perceptive she is on, let's see, back on 102. Um, she, in preparing to go to Tulsa, she goes to the Spruce Pine Library to look it up in the encyclopedia, and she finds it. Uh, uh, Tulsa was listed in the Americana Volume 27, Trance to Venial Sin. I got so tickled with that, I forgot to write down the rest. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she is so perceptive in how she sees irony. And then uh, just a couple of paragraphs down, she um, says, uh, this is the day which the Lord hath made. But before Monty, what kind of days was he sending me? I cross out the line. I have this wish to praise instead of him, the littlest things, honeybees and the wet slugs under their rocks, a gnat in some farmer's eye. <laughs> Now that is a rich spirituality. Mm -hmm. Now what do you make of the, um, when she gets to the, to the preacher's church, which looks like a big insurance office um, over here on 105, looks like a big insurance office, though I can tell where the chapel is by the colored glass and the pointed windows carved in an arch over the door of the words, hope of glory building. Right away, something in me sinks. 
all this time I've been hearing it on TV as the hope and glory building. You wouldn't think one word could make that much difference. So what, what is the difference the word makes? Oh my, basically we're not there yet. <laughs> yeah, it's something, when you say hope of, it's something that's put off, it's out there somewhere. Whether it's in this life, maybe not even in this life, maybe sometime in the next life. But for her, she wanted hope and glory. That's, that's the immediate reality she wants to experience. But doesn't she experience the glory of creation everywhere she goes? She sure does. It with her. Totally absorbs it. Yeah. Oh, and absorbs it down to the minutest detail. Um, so then as she uh, has the encounter with the, um, let's see, where is that? The preacher's assistant. Um, I love the way she expresses this. I reach inside my notebook where tape shut is the thick envelope with everything written down. I knew I could never explain things right. When have I ever been able to tell what I really felt? But it's all in there. My name, my need the words from the Bible, which must argue for me. I don't sit there nights since, since Papa died counting my money and studying God's book for nothing, playing solitaire, then going back to search the next page and the next, stopping outside to rest my eyes on his limitless sky, then back to the book and the paper, building my case. So she sees scripture as her friend, She's embracing scripture for what it can do for her. Uh, on the other hand, the preacher's assistant, he's not interested at all in the physical reality. Um, and he gives her this uh, pious explanation, calling her my child. Um, and uh, he asks it to pray for her spirit. And she says, never mind my spirit. <laughs> <laughs> I see he doesn't really understand. I see he will live a long life and not marry. <laughs> oh, dear. And he's no beauty queen himself. No, not according to her description. Right. <clears throat> and uh, so she takes matters into her own hands. Uh, she, she goes right into the chapel and walks right up into the pulpit, which in that tradition, that's kind of the that's kind of like the uh, the holy of holies. That's the closest you get to God. And she says to, I'm right over here. She says to, to to Jesus, "I've been praising you, Lord, but it gets harder every year." Maybe that sounds too strong. I try to ease up my tone before the amens. <laughs> and then, despite what's happened, despite this complete deflation and being completely let down. Uh, she walks back to the hotel and repeating over and over, praise God for Tulsa in spite of everything. She's just totally wrapped up in uh, how wonderful God is. And she goes, I mean, it just repeats on this, um, this page several times, uh, praise God for Oklahoma, uh, for Wagoner and Sapula and Broken Arrow. Praise God for oil towers, whether I like them or not. Praise them all. We pass churches, praise them all. Mm. And then the, um, the beautiful scene at the very end of the story uh, where she is, uh, you know, you would think that uh, here's this man that's been waiting for you since daybreak and you would be excited to see him but she is so defensive she is so scared of ultimate rejection that she runs from it and he's calling after her and calling after her she runs harder um and uh flick is there also the black guy and she he tries to head her off on one uh way and uh he so here's the the last last paragraph Monty's between me and my bus but there's time I circle the cab stand running hard over the asphalt field with a pain ticking in my side he calls me I plunge through the crowd like a deer through fetter brush but he's running as hard as he can and he's faster than me and oh 
praise God, he's <laughs> catching me. Which is what she really wanted, uh, the relationship. So uh, someone asked uh, Betts uh, about this. She had interesting reactions to this story in, in North Carolina in 1973 when it was published. Some people were absolutely scandalized by the sex scene, including some of her students at UNC at the time were scandalized by the sex scene. Um, but other reactions, uh, she had a, a woman, they, they had more, more um, romantic reactions to it. One woman asked her, said, that, so do they end up getting married? And Doris said, well, I wouldn't presume to answer any question about what happens after the story, but I think they're probably together about two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this sex scene proved that we are all sinners. No matter how much we believe in God and glorify Him and everything, we're still sinners. Mm -hmm. No, I, I had a different reaction. I thought I thought it was really sweet. And then afterwards on the bus, he goes into he buys her little things, including chewing gum. So obviously it was not exploited. He really has an attraction and a and a sweet feeling towards her. Well, I think it's still against the Bible. <laughs> well, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's a it's a very deep feeling on both sides. Um, and I think the the sex is just a a um, way of acting that out. I don't think I don't I don't see that as a gratuitous scene. I see it as a as a fulfillment of relationship. Um, okay. She, well. had, she had almost convinced me that he wasn't going to be there. I I thought her she was so convinced that it wasn't going to you know it, it was just a beautiful I don't know. Yeah, she's quite ambivalent about it, isn't she? I mean, she's she's she. At one instant she is bracing herself for him being there, and the next instant she's going, "Oh no, he's not there." Yeah, that's all her self persecution, which she proves to be unwarranted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, any other um, final thoughts or um, reactions on our story this morning? But how does, how do you see, how does, what is Bet's view of the way in which grace happens? Hmm. It can surprise you. It's surprising. Yes, definitely surprising. Unexpected. Unexpected. Maybe even uh, if, if she were an Anglican, she would say it was a sacrament, an outward invisible sign of an inward and spiritual mm -hmm. yeah. condition, grace. Yeah, because yeah, it's not, uh, you know, for Violet, the grace, the grace she's both, the grace she's seeking and the grace she experiences are very corporeal. They're very, they're very physical. It's not some abstract spiritual thing. So it's interesting to compare and contrast with uh, Flannery. Uh, you know, those of you who've read Flannery's stories, the grace in there, man, it happens by getting hit in the head with a book. It happens by getting shot in the chest. <laughs> it just happens in all of these very, very violent ways. Uh, but for her, that's the, ultimately, that brings the person into recognition of either their, themselves, their own need, or in recognition of of the larger presence of God or the larger connectivity of humanity, um, for Betts, it's it's much more it's much more gentle and it's um, it's uh, really kind of fulfilling. You know, at the end of Flannery's stories, you're often left going, "Oh God," mm -hmm. but at the end of this story, you're left going, "Oh, oh. she got him," you know. <laughs> Even if only for two weeks. <laughs> Even if it's only two weeks. It ends like a Hallmark story. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's beautiful, Nina. Yeah. But not without, I mean, you know, it not, doesn't have the kind of saccharine quality of a, of a Hallmark story, though, does it? I mean, there's some real, there's some grit and reality in the story. You to had get, to work hard to get there. She sure did. Yep. <clears throat> well, um, I guess we are 
about uh, used up all of our time. I really have enjoyed being part of this series a couple of times I was able to join this summer and um, always stimulated by being part of Faith Forum. But thank you all for your participation and your presence this morning. And um, we'll hopefully see you virtually or in person before too long. One day. Well, this John, we really, we really want to thank you because you have a clear enthusiasm and appreciation of literature and have a marvelous way of sharing that with us. So thank, thank you, you very much for doing that. Susan, did you have something? I just thank you for this morning. It was interesting. Yeah. Good. Thank glad you. you're glad you're here. And that's a high compliment coming from a professional teacher. So appreciate that. <laughs> And we want to thank Oween who set up this series and selected many of the stories that we've read. And Oween, a few of the people here were not with us last week. Do you want to share what you're taking on now? Yeah, this is my last hurrah uh, at the cathedral. I'm so thankful for everybody that participated in the forum and especially those of you who have been here with us every Sunday and you know savored the presentations. I am beginning as the... Uh, Christian Formation Coordinator at St. Mary of the Hills up here um, for a period of time. We're not sure how long, but um, I'm looking forward to that. But I'm stepping away from the cathedral and um, I'm very thankful that the person I handpicked to take my place said yes. <laughs> so Michael Corrigan will be um, leading the troops in formation at the cathedral going forward. Okay. And we do have a little bit of a hiatus for the next few weeks. Our next Wednesday evening adult class will be on September 8th, the day after the Wednesday after Labor Day. And then the Sunday, September 12th will be the first of Dean Kate's offerings in her Dean's Forum for this fall. And that both of those will be offered both in person for anyone who wishes to come to the cathedral, but also will be offered online for anyone who either wishes to stay home or is just simply not in the Jacksonville area. So both the parables class on Wednesday night and the Dean's Forum on Sunday morning are available online. Thank you again, John, for what you do. Thank you to all of you for taking part. I we'll hope you have a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful Sunday and take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.